With apologies from John bon, uh, for John Bon Jovi, I want to welcome you to tonight's uh, Humanity Class webinar series sponsored by the National Humanity Center. Tonight's episode is titled, Will the 20s Be the 30s? Narrative Journalism and Lessons from the Great Depression. I'm joined by Dale Marriage, writer and professor in the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University. Today is December the 2nd, 2021. I want to welcome all of you for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Andy Mink. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Education Programs at the Center. On behalf of my staff, Jira and Mike and Meredith, we want to thank you for spending another evening with us. This is a doubleheader week. We've got two webinars this week, and it's I feel fortunate to see so many of the same names, if not faces, in the room tonight. I appreciate you taking uh, time from your busy uh, professional and personal lives. In particular, I want to note that uh, Charles is joining us tonight from Iowa State University. And William is back. Good to see you, William, from Putnam Valley High School. Um, it's always great to see so many LAUSD educators, including Janet and Tyler and Lauren. And Jason, it's nice to see you. Jason's here from the St. Louis Public Library. It's nice to see such a wide uh, geographic diversity in the room. And I think uh, tonight's theme and, and topic is going to be particularly appropriate as we imagine uh, this landscape of, of America and the people in it. That landscape includes Durham, North Carolina, where the center is located. Uh, founded in 1978, we welcome and support an annual fellowship class of university humanists. These are university professors who have academic projects. They have books and research and writing and conversations to have. We also support writers and artists and uh, performance artists. These are people who are making sense of the world through the humanities. They are providing us insights and allowing us to eavesdrop on other people's experiences, I think, to better understand our own and being able to interact with voices and with images and with movements and with migrations really does, I think, remind us that we're not here alone, even though sometimes it's a pretty lonely place. Um, I think the humanities offer an optimistic view of that, and it does remind us that we're connected in many, many ways. And again, uh, I think and I hope that tonight's session uh, reminds you of uh, many of those same themes. As you explore this, both the topic tonight and other topics that are associated with it, I do encourage you to continue to use the Humanities of Class Digital Library. Uh, this free and open space is designed to give you direct access to the instructional materials and the scholarship that the center produces, as well as 95 other humanities organizations that partner with us. That does include the readings for tonight's session. These have been provided by Professor Mayridge, and whether you've read them in advance or perhaps want to read them afterwards as a way to reflect on tonight's conversation, you can always find them here in the Humanities in Class webinar series group. I would encourage you to, to uh, sign up for that and to access these documents there. That also includes some instructional resources that have been pulled together by tonight's TA to give you some inspiration, if not some direction, on how to connect this with uh, the students, the younger students that you teach. I suspect that one of the things that many of you uh, appreciate or find appealing about our webinars is the ways uh, that we offer language as that connecting tissue between people. Again, as I described the humanities as this, this way to identify identity and then to connect with others, language is a big part of that, whether it's verbal or text, whether it's visual or uh, physical. And I do encourage you to take a look at our upcoming uh, webinars. We're about, I don't know, we're about a third of the way through this year's season. And we've had a lot of wonderful sessions so far with many more to come. So take a look at the spring sessions. Uh, you know, I, I think it's likely that many of you went and signed up for a lot of them all at once. And then now this might be a chance to go back and review some of those that uh, several months ago you thought might not fit your schedule or might not fit your interests. In particular, I encourage you to take a look at the uh, first session of the new year with Nathan uh, Goldberg. He's a professor of philosophy at Washington and Lee and will be sharing his work on superhero thought experiments in which he places many of uh, our iconic superheroes in different situations and then uses philosophical discourse to help younger people understand uh, the, the, the ways, the, the thought process of being a philosopher. It also includes our session with Phil Nell. He's a professor of English at Kansas State, and we'll discuss uh, Dr. Seuss, among other uh, early 20th century uh, children's uh, writers and, and young adult writers, and uh, how to contextualize that with your, your 21st century students. And it concludes, uh, or at least this series of, of sessions concludes with Scott Saul. He's at Stanford and he'll be working with us on uh, the ways that uh, humor, like Richard Pryor and Archie Bunker, that irreverent humor 
can actually help us uh, identify and think uh, more clearly about teaching offensive language. So again, sign up. These are free. We love to have you at all of them and do share them with your colleagues and your department. I want to thank our Teacher Advisory Council, as I always do, for their continued contributions. Uh, that includes tonight's TA, uh, Brianne uh, Johnston, who is uh, joining us from Hot Springs, uh, Arkansas. Uh, these TAC members are an uh, ongoing uh, way for us to stay connected to the classroom and better understand, I hope, the needs and the gaps that you face in your curriculum, in your classroom, and the culture that you're teaching in, and things that we can address. Still, your voice is super important. And uh, I think it's likely that you've received an email from me in the last few days regarding our Humanities in Class Community Survey. We haven't done this for a while, and we would love to get a better sense of what you like and what you don't, uh, what you need, and what we can provide in terms of support for your uh, teacher leadership and for the curriculum work that you do. It's a pretty short survey. It's about 10 to 12 minutes, uh, depending on how, how involved you'd like to be. But we will be uh, conducting a drawing uh, before each webinar in which we award one of our participants, one of the survey uh, responses, choices from a menu of humanities items. Those, that menu includes books that have been associated with the entire fall slate of sessions. That does include, by the way, Professor Marriage's book that he'll be uh, talking with us about tonight. It also includes the choice of a free humanities in class online course, an NHC swag bag, and while travel is not covered, if you're in the Durham area, you can have lunch with the education team. We'll be holding these drawings before each webinar, and uh, we will close the survey on December 17th. I really appreciate your contributions and give it, giving us a chance to, um, to uh, understand better what we can do to support you. So tonight's uh, winner, we just, uh, Meredith, my colleague Meredith, just recently uh, in the last 10 minutes selected tonight's winner, and I'm very pleased to announce that Irene Sanchez from Riverside, California is winner number two. She joins Nestor Rave, uh, the, the last drawing uh, recipient uh, in our winner's circle. I'll get in touch with Irene and give her a choice of the menu that I just described. Please do take a few moments and complete that survey. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm also going to drop the link in the audience chat box. I don't know that you can click that, but you can at least cut and paste it and open it in a side, um, side browser if you like. So as a reminder, uh, tonight's webinar, our episode will be audio and PowerPoint only, but your contributions will be very, very important. Please do use the audience chat to uh, reflect, to respond, to uh, make exclamations, to tell jokes, to share URLs. Use the Ask the Professor tab to submit formal questions. And as the uh, moderator, I'll be queuing those up. And every now and again, Professor uh, Marijan and I will take a break uh, I'll bring some of those questions to him and allow him to respond extemporaneously. We would love to have your questions help drive uh, the conversation tonight. So again, you have uh, joined us for the Humanities in Class webinar titled, Will the 20s Be the 30s? Narrative Journalism and Lessons from the Great Depression. I'm very pleased and excited to be joined by Dale Marriage, a professor in the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia. I'm also very grateful for Brian Johnston from Cutter Morningstar High School in Hot Springs, Arkansas, for joining us uh, and being here tonight. She's going to be dropping ideas and thoughts uh, and questions in the chat box, and I appreciate her support. Hey, Dale, can you hear me up there in New York City? I hear you in New York. I hope you can hear me uh, in <laughs> L.A., which seems to be the dominant uh, group of people here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> That's certainly true. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And, and before I turn the, the PowerPoint over to you, I've actually would like you to take a moment, if you don't mind, to reflect back on my opening question. I'm gonna pull this back up so you can see it again and remind our audience of this question. Professor, what does the American dream represent to you? What, how, do you how would you define this, this sort of elusive concept, the American dream, and in, in your own personal experience, not your work, not the folks you've talked to and visited with, but just for you, what, what, how, how has that evolved over the course of your lifetime? Well, look, I was born in mid-50s America, and if you were a white male, uh, you pretty much had a guaranteed path, even if you screwed up as much as I did. <laughs> I dropped out of college, and you know, I did a lot of things wrong, but it all turned out right. Um, I'm, the first uh, slides I'm going to show you are, are my youth. I, I wanted to show that I came from a working-class background, 
and the son of a steel worker to become a professor at Columbia. Uh, uh, it was a, a, a it wasn't an easy course, but it was a charted course, and it's not so easy now. And what is the American dream has dominated my work? That question, and I want to you know just tonight I'm very excited about this conversation because I had a, a talk with a, a very dear friend a week ago who's a very famous documentarian. I'm not going to use her name because you know we've documented this stuff now for 40 years. I've lived it. I was born in it. I grew up with it. I I, I, I immersed in working class people my entire adult working life. Um, but what next? And I, I really do think it lands on, on kids, on youth. And so I, in the chat box, I've seen a lot of thoughts and talk. And in a weird way, I feel like I know some of you, you listeners already just by the tone of these, these comments in the chat box. So I'm, I'm hoping we land in a place where the what next can be answered uh, uh, both for, for you as teachers, most of you, and me as a documentarian, what I do next. Uh, but it's very much rooted in my youth. Yeah, that's a great answer. And I, I, I want to put a little finer point on it, if I may. And that is, um, I agree. I think all of our audience agrees wholeheartedly that, you know, the, the young people are, are really the hope. Is that different now or maybe more magnified than it would have been for previous generations? I, I mean, I suspect that, that most people would say that kids are the next year or the hope. But why is that so much different now than it was several generations ago? That's a great question, Andy. I think it's magnified because I'm seeing it. Okay, I'm, I teach at an elite university. I still get some working class people here, though, believe it or not. But I see it in young people. They're different than the Gen X generation, uh, uh, you know, from the 80s and the 90s. Uh, they're, 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 they, they, they know a lot of what's going on. And they really have a lot of passion for change. Uh, climate, I think climate change is a big factor in this. Uh, they're mm -hmm. very active. They're very involved. Uh, and when I go around the country and I talk to young, young people, I see it. So um, it's a different group, and I'm still trying to figure it out. But I, I just think they're more engaged. Uh, there's a theory, uh, I go re re really quickly into it. It's one of the, one of the readings, the long wave theory by, by Mr. Kondratiev from Russia, the, the, the economist. There's like five kinds of generations. Uh, and the 1930s generation, if you believe in his theory, is happening today. This young cohort coming in to uh, social awareness and, and who, who are entering the world of the working world, the world of ideas, they're that generation that's going to affect the change. So uh, that's a very uh, condensed version of what I feel. But I, I do think it's a different generation. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And there's been uh, a lot of work on generational histories and sort of tracing the you know, the, the archetypes that cultures uh, s seem to show. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot and go too far astray, and then I, I really want to get into your talk. But one last question to even put a finer point on this is, is the conversation we're having uh, focused exclusively on American culture, or is this a global conversation? Well, it's a global conversation, and I, I have reported internationally, but I know the American um, uh, through the prism of America best. But, oh, no, no, it's an, it's an international conversation. Uh, ca yeah. uh, capitalism has to change. And I, I don't, by that, you, when you say something like that, people think you're, you're you know, talking about you know, communism. And, and, and it's some, there's some other ism. And I'm not quite sure what it is yet. Uh, and near the end of the talk, I want to talk about what I found in Cleveland uh, through, the, uh, through a company uh, called the Evergreen Corporation. They copied the Spanish Mogadon model, which is a worker-owned cooperative model. They're doing amazing stuff. Um, it's capitalism for humans. Uh, and I think that's part of the answer, what we're talking about here. But it comes down, you know, it, it was said in the, the election in 1992, it's the economy, stupid. Uh, <laughs> you know, if people have jobs and are working and can support themselves and feed themselves, uh, it, it goes a long way towards making social harmony. Uh, and we're a long way from that. There's a lot of poverty in this country, a lot of poverty in the world. Uh, I, I was in the Philippines reporting, and I, I've seen some some really really harsh stuff. Uh, and I think I think some of the answers go go, go cross cross borders. Fantastic, uh, Dale. Thank you so much for for indulging those questions. I'm really looking forward to your talk again. As the moderator, what I'll be doing is bringing questions to you on occasion. So. Uh, 
we, we want to hear your story, and we'll be peppering you with questions along the way. Oh, uh, Andy, please cut in because you know, I've got about 35 images here, but but uh, you know, just pop in where we think we we can we can stop, pause, and we can we can kind of develop some of the ideas. Great. All right, I'm gonna I put the first image up. You see the the blast furnace? Yes. Yes, great. This was the blast furnace that was Otis Steel in 1932 or 33, where my my maternal grandfather worked. I took this image in 1983 from a, an abandoned bridge that went over the valley in Cleveland, the Cuyahoga Valley. Uh, uh, this is what work meant to me when I was growing up. Steel, making things. Um, uh, this is a, a wider view of that plant. It's all gone. This has all been torn down. There is nothing here. There's a, actually, there's a Walmart at this site right now. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, but there's still a steel mill in Cleveland, but it's much, much smaller than it was. And I grew up with, with looking back, I, I was a student of my elders. Uh, this is a picture, again, some of my, our, our, our listeners are, are probably driving in Los Angeles right now, so you can look at these images later. There's a picture of, of Roosevelt on the wall of this bar called Hutz's. Hutz's Cafe, family owned since 1919. I went there again just before the pandemic and, and FDR was still on the wall. This is the bar where my grandparents, my paternal grandparents used to drink. Um, and we, you know, we believed in the 30s were bad, and we overcame them. We, we pulled together as a society, at least that's the myth I grew up with. We cared for workers, we, and we got out of the Great Depression. Um, and there was a contract in America at that point. Pretty much, you know, you worked in the factory, your kids are going to go to college, and they're going to do better. This is me. My father was a very hardworking man. He had a day job at... Um, Cleveland Twist Drill. He was an industrial tool grinder. And he had this, in our basement, he had this shop with these giant machines, which he eventually moved out to a building behind our house. And I worked for him. This is me at age 17 in the shop. Uh, it was a selfie. I put the camera on a timer. It's not a very good picture. Better picture of my dad. I took this in 1983 of him grinding in the shop. And this is a picture of my dad uh, with the shop behind him. Uh, World War II veteran. Uh, uh, you can see he's kind of an angry guy here. That's that's kind of, was kind of his persona. But actually, very nice guy. But hey, I grew hey up Dale. Up. Yes, Dale. I I am going to actually interrupt if you don't mind and and ask you this question about these images because they're so personal and first person. Tell us a little bit more about what this work actually is because if I'm honest, I mean I'm a little bit younger than you, but not by much. But these images to me are. Uh, are fictional in a way, right? I mean, that, in other words, I don't know what's happening. What what kind of work is this? Are they, what are they making? What is the, can you describe is, it to us? Oh, absolutely. Okay. This is, um, my father ground industrial cutting tools. They, they would grind steel. Okay. You fly in an airplane. Well, the wing has been molded in a factory by tools that cut into steel to make the shape that you see. So they would, they would, he sharpened those tools. So uh, Alcoa, the aluminum company of America, like fighter jets, he ground the steel tools that they used to make the, um, the steel molds for the wings for airplanes. So what you see here, some of the machine he's leaning against was one of the things he used for the Alcoa work. Um, uh, it was a very uh, 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 integrated kind of system of, of different suppliers. He, you know, somebody made the steel, somebody cast it, my father ground steel. Um, it, it, it was called a job shop. So he was considered, he was a piece of this mosaic of support for this much larger right. industry. Uh, the tools he ground were for job shops that, that actually did the die sinking and so forth. Um, it's, it's pretty much gone. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, computer technology has replaced a lot of this, actually. Uh, it is another world. It does feel mythological. Actually, I lived it and it feels mythological. Yeah. Yeah, thank so you. I, I, thank you for that. And and again, uh, you've sort of opened this door. And so I, I don't want to be too personal with my questions, but I'm curious when I look at your dad here, you know, my dad is the same generation. My dad's 86 this year. Um, wh what was fulfilling about this for either? I mean, you can talk about your dad specifically or maybe just the the, the American male in this setting. What What was the fulfilling part? Was it the hard work? Was it the you know, the, the knowledge that their children would do better. What, how do they approach it was, this? 
it, it was it was the children who do better. We would take a vacation to Canada or Florida for two weeks every year uh, in a camper that was purchased by the you know the work in the factories. Uh, uh, we we had a we had a little boat. We'd go up to Lake Erie and we'd fish. Uh, it meant a good it meant a good life. And then when my sister and I and my brother, you know, what it meant your kids were going to live that so-called American dream. Um, and it really was the American dream if you were white, if you were a person of color in this era. Different story. Uh, yeah. We'll get into that later. Uh, but uh, there was a contract, and and. It wasn't in an egalitarian society, but there was potential to to rise above your your position. Um, and I know some of the questions in the chat have talked about immigrants, and it depends where you're coming from. If you come from a place like like I, you know, I've reported in Mexico and in Central America, and you come from that kind of grinding poverty, anything is better. You know, the American dream still exists. Uh, it's a different American dream than I had to like, you know. I have to right. Say. Right. Thank you. So I leave this world and I go to California. That's why I'm 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 digging on the all the LA people here. I went to the Sacramento Bee up in Sacramento and I did a lot of reporting in LA. I've sat in classrooms in LA back in the eighties. Uh I have, you know, modest knowledge of of the school system in Los Angeles, uh, especially in Southeast and Huntington Park area. Uh spent a lot of time there in the nineties actually in a high school in Huntington Park. So anyway I I started reporting in America, <laughs> and this was a lot of these photographs that you see from here on out are from Michael Williamson, my photographic collaborator. Um, and we, I'm at the Sacramento newspaper, and things started changing. Uh, there was a lot of joblessness. There was a recession. This is the headline in the newspaper from 1982: 12 million jobless enough. And we, we got an assignment to go ride the rails with these new breed of hobos. Just like the 1930s, mostly men were riding the, uh, the, uh, the, the rails, looking for work, using them kind of as a, almost like a bus to get to places. And the editor said, go ride the rails. And so Dick Schmidt actually took this picture, our, our colleague. Uh, there, for those of you driving and, or not watching the pictures, there's a condemned uh, sign on the rail car behind us. Uh, we rode the rails. This is the first trip in 1982. Uh, uh, we we this is near Fresno, California. Uh, Michael Williamson took this picture by jumping across the train going 70 miles an hour, strapping the camera to uh, one of the bars, jumping back, and I look angry because I'm he's going to die getting this picture. But we lived it, and this this is what was our life for the next two years. We went with these new new guys on the rails like this fellow you see here, uh, going through uh, Sacramento. But we, they were coming from somewhere. They were looking for work, and so we wanted to connect the dots. So giving my youth what you saw in those earlier images, I'd read about Youngstown, Ohio. There was 25 miles of steel mills along the Mahoning River, and they closed all of them down, pretty much all of them down by, by the early 80s. So we decided to show cause and effect. Just like in The Grapes of Wrath with John Steinbeck, you had people leaving the Dust Bowl, we called it the Rust Bowl. People were, were fleeing Ohio and coming west looking for work. So we went back to Youngstown in 1983. Um, this is the image of one of the dead steel mills in the Mahoning Valley. Uh, and we immersed in the lives of the workers. And we found Ken Platt here and his son. This is Jeanette Blast Furnace in the Briar Hill Works. Uh, Bruce Springsteen later sings about this very Blast Furnace in his song. Very proud of people who were third generation steel workers, suddenly he's laying carpet four hours a day and he can't feed his children. Then we met the Marshall family, Joe Marshall and his son. Uh, in this image, you see Joe Marshall Sr. on the right and Joe Marshall Jr. on the left. Uh, they're in the ruins of the Ohio Works, which was uh, U.S. Steel's plant in Youngstown. It had like 7,500 workers at peak. And they closed it down in the late 70s. And in 1982, they dynamited the entire uh, works. Uh, this is a very hard emotional picture here because we met Mr. Marshall and his son at their house about two miles from this plant. And when we talked to them the first time, they told us about Mr. Marshall, 37 and a half years in the mill. He went to World War II. He was at the D-Day Normandy landing. 
only one of four survivors from his landing craft. His son came into the mill, and then the contract ended. And the second time I met them, I said, Mr. Marshall, this is a hard thing to ask you, but could you show us where you worked? And he said, yes. So we went back again. We got in their car, and in two years since the mill had closed, they had not been back there two miles from their house, and we walked around the mill with them, documenting uh, this, this, this place. Um, and they showed us where, where things had been. They were very reflective. What you see in the background here is the Briar Hill Works for Youngstown Sheen and Tube, and a, a sintering plant for, for one of the operations. Uh, and at one point, I, you probably can't, maybe you can't read this, but, uh, and I can't because it's so small on my screen, <laughs> but Mr. Marshall said, I'll put my glasses on, what Hitler couldn't do, they did it for him. Now, he didn't speak this to me in a question. He spoke this to the wind. I was just standing behind him because this is the kind of thing where you, it's like going to the cemetery with somebody whose family, mother has died. You, you can't talk to them. I just listened. That's my job description. I listened. And I wrote that down in my notebook. And uh, I put it in the book. We, we did a book called Journey to Nowhere, the saga of the new underclass. It came out in 1985. It was about these new, new job lists, this new thing that was happening in America. Ten years later, I um, uh, uh, get a phone call from somebody who says they work for Bruce Springsteen. And Bruce put it in his song, which you played, Andy, at the start of all this, in his song, it's them big boys did what Hitler could do. He channeled Mr. Marshall in that song. And if you've heard the rock version of Bruce's song, it's very angry. Bruce captured in about 256 words, more plus or minus one or two words, my entire book in that song. Don't read my book, my first book. Listen to Bruce's Youngstown, the rock version. You know everything you need to know about what happened to these people. Now, this will probably be a good place to stop and talk about anger, Andy. Uh, anger in America was rising at this point by 96. I, I was continuing reporting around America. Uh, I went back to Youngstown. It was funny. Um, we, so when, uh, when, uh, when Bruce, uh, uh, so Bruce, Bruce, we got this call, and, and he said, Bruce is going to be at the Shoreline Amphitheater. I was teaching at Stanford University then. Uh, he wants to meet you. So Michael Williamson happened to be in California. We go to the shoreline. I've never met Bruce before. I mean, I mean, Bruce freaking Springsteen, are you kidding me? <laughs> I'm, I'm a little nervous, a little scared. We got it. What I'm in the audience, Bruce sang this song, some of his songs. We went backstage, uh, and we were, we were waiting for Bruce to come off stage, and he's with Neil Young. It was Neil Young's Bridge Benefit, and he's slapping Neil on the back. And he's coming up to me. And I'm looking at him, and as he's walking towards me, I get struck in the back by somebody rushing out of their dressing room. It was Chrissy Hine from The Pretenders. Smash it into me. <laughs> Almost knocked me over. She was on stage next. Bruce comes up. He says, you know, get in my dressing room. So I shook Neil's hand, Bruce's hand. We go in his dressing room, and he offered us whiskey and, boo and beer. I said, give me some whiskey, Bruce. And he, the first thing I said was, and I'll clean it up. I said, Bruce, how the F did you hear about our book? He says, I bought it when it came out. He was in a bookstore. He bought our book. <laughs> and anyway, we, we met him, and he was really, I mean, he got our, he got our book, and he got, he got it. And he says, is there anything I can do? And I said, well, if we promote, propose a, a, a reissue, would you be interested in maybe writing an introduction? He says, sure. So Michael and I hit the road, and we found 10 years later this is, oops, that's me coming out of the mill with Bruce. We, we snuck in. Uh, I'll tell that story before I go into the, into the other next story. So, so in 96, Bruce uh, uh, is plays in Youngstown. I fly there. CBS News does a, a thing on us. And Bruce says at the end, he says, you know, could, can I see the Jenny Blast furnace? And I said, Bruce, I said, if you go, we go in there, Cargill owns it now. There's a guard. And so I knew somebody was arrested a week before. He said, they'll make a point of arresting you. Trust me. Is there a way to do it, he said. I said, yeah, we can sneak in the back way. So let's do it. <laughs> so, so the professor we knew drove us the back way. We stuck in through the back, through the snow, and visited the Jenny Blast Furnace. Um, 
And it was like visiting a temple. Bruce walked around alone, just kind of taking it all in. Uh, and we had a long conversation about America and the anger I was seeing. So uh, it was uh, it was a very powerful moment, and he's, it was very real. He, he you know he he got us and he got it. So that led us to go and let's go run America and update the book. So we went back to Youngstown. This is about a month later. The snow had melted, and this is where the plant had been. And we spent a number of days going across America. And what we heard and saw and felt was what one of the readings I gave you guys uh, from the first, from the reissue of this book, you know, the anger that John Russo talks about in working class people. Uh, this is going to lead to something bad. And he didn't predict specifically Donald Trump and the rise of a lot of that rage, but he pretty much predicted the, the election in 2016. Uh, and so we went to America and we documented this rage. Uh, 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 and we found things I never saw before. This is a couple who, in Laughlin, Nevada, who had come home from work. Their work home was a, was a shack on the Colorado River. They were voluntarily homeless because they were saving for an apartment. This is a different breed of homeless than you, than you see, uh, you used to see when I was a kid. Voluntarily homeless, and now in Los Angeles, I was reporting in Los Angeles in the pandemic in 2020, and there's thousands of people who live out of their cars, who live in tents, who actually have jobs. Uh, some of them are, are Los Angeles listeners, maybe teaching some of the parents of these kids. Um, and it's shocking to me that this is America today. Uh, this is very much like what I saw, see in Mexico and the Philippines. So it, it really hit me hard. Um, but when 9-11 happened, so uh, let me go before I sh I'll show the next slide. I'm teaching at Stanford University at this point. I'm back in California. I'm, kind of a, I'm from Cleveland, but I'm, I've become kind of a California dude. Um, uh, but I, 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 I was lured back by a, 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 the, the dean here to teach for one term in the fall of 20, uh, I mean, sorry, 2001. Uh, and I come back in August, and on 9-11, I watched the second tower go down from my rooftop. I'd heard about the first tower. I rushed to my rooftop, and I watched the second tower fall. Uh, this is a photograph of Michael Williamson the next day uh, at so-called Ground Zero among the ruins of the World Trade Center. And the first thing I did was I didn't go down there. I never went there. I still, to this day, I've not gone down there. I don't want to see it. But I... I, I knew about the anger that John Russo, the professor, had told me about when I was in Youngstown, and I decided I have to document America in this this period. And there was a there was a something was going on. It, it was a turning point. We did a book called Homeland. Uh, it came out in 2004. Uh, believe it or not, this title was new then. <laughs> there was no show on TV called this. There was no uh, nobody else had this. Uh, I called it this because uh, I wanted to document the, the changes in America. Again, not going to to Ground Zero, but going back to Youngstown and going to other places. Uh, this is a a, a, a concert uh, that Michael went to, a patriotic concert. Uh, uh, you saw the flag a lot after 9-11. You saw people's bodies, but you also saw this. A lot of hate, a lot of... Uh, uh, this is where the immigrant bashing started in in, in our country, uh, uh, and I, I really immersed in the groups at the po at that point that were, were were kind of the the main groups, the National Alliance and the World Church of the Creator. They're both defunct now. They morphed into the Oath Keepers uh, and, and other the Proud Boys and other groups. But I, I tried to understand this rage, uh, and. I spent a lot of time with these people, and I, you know, um, it was funny. There was a guy uh, I found who was a World Church of the Creator uh, uh, adherent, very violent group, and I reached out to, to him via the email. Was then new in 2000. And this is 2002 now, early 2002. It was those of you out there who are, are my age will know Elm and Pine, who were academics. <laughs> it was really bad stuff. But I reached out to this guy, 
And I said, you're going to look me up and you're going to see I'm a quote unquote liberal, but you're going to see also that I listen to people and I'm fair. I would like to talk to you and hear about you. And so this guy, uh, uh, I can say his name now because he's, 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 he's a different man than he was, Mr. Schleichman. He reached out. He says, yes, I'll meet with you. Uh, let's meet at a place called the, uh, uh, it was called the Phoenix in Chicago. Uh, there was a, a lot of hate uh, action going on against Muslims in Chicago. So we, uh, we met, and he, the first thing he said when we sat down was, you, yeah, you know, you, you, I Googled you. Yeah, you are fair. But I said, I want you to understand, he said, I'm a national, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a socialist, and I don't mean national socialist. I'm an environmentalist. We have to stop. We have to stop. He was talking about climate change in 2002. He said, uh, I'm, an, I'm a strong union man. We just disagree about race. And so I listened to him for the next hour. And you know what? He was right. We, we agreed. That it was 80%. He was a lefty. <laughs> but I said, at the end, I said, uh, I, yeah, you, you're right. We do agree on most things. But I do disagree with you on race. Absolutely. And he said, at the, as we parted, he said, you're the first person not from my group ever to listen to me, Dale. Thank you. So the funny thing is, about two years later, he renounced his hate. He he turned around. He he was educable. I'm sorry, I think you were going to cut in there, Andy. You wanted to say something? But I do. I mean, I, I think you, you've shared a lot of very interesting things. That We have some questions queuing up and some things I'd like to uh, maybe probe into a little bit with you if this is a good time to pause. And I and I think this I think it's a great time to pause and it, it kind of start, kind of kind of take apart some of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna unpack a little bit. So uh, let me begin with this relatively broad question, and that is um, as a as a journalist, as a writer, as a um, as a documentarian, do you feel that photojournalism in particular but journalism in general is about documentation or is it about interpretation? And where, how do you keep those two things separate? You don't. If you're going to immerse the way I have and it's part of my life and I, I spend, Andy, I spend some of these families I've known for 30 years, 35 years. I spend time with people. I get to know them. So it's, it's, more, it's more than just documentation. It's immersion. It's it's taking it to another level. Uh, and right. yes, I have something to say. I have a point of view. Uh, I come at it with love. I don't spend time with people I don't like. Uh, I, I really think we have to to bridge understandings. And so that's why I, I I went down this road of talking to these people. But something's changed, and this is where the conversation is going to get uh, interesting. I hope. You know. Yeah. The next picture I'm going to show you is from uh, an abandoned house in the south, and it's, it's Martin and Bobby Clock, and it's you can see it's faded, it's it's old, it's it's, it's definitely from the 60s, probably late 60s, probably after both of them were killed, 1968, which was a very pivotal year in my youth. Um, the hopes of both Dr. King and 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 Bobby, uh, you know, were kind of gunned down in 1968. And how do we get to a place of hope again? And this is where I'll bring in the conversation with my colleague. She's documented more of the current right wing than I have. I have not immersed in the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys. I, I haven't been able to. She has. And she said, Dale, I, I'm not sure our work is, is going to convince anybody. You know, um, what do we do next? And, and, this is where I'm at right now in, in, and it's not just the internet, it's not just social media. There's something else going on in, the, in our culture. We, we are not talking to each other. And I'm trying to find ways where we can talk to each other. Uh, going and spending time with the Oath Keepers is not part of that for me. Um, there's got to be a place where we can work, and, and that's where I guess where I could bring it back to kids. My friend, my documentarian friend, who again I'm not naming because I, I don't want to invade her privacy, said, Dale, people are formed when they're like we were, when you're 12 or 13 or 14. What are the books are you reading? What are, what's, what, what's, what's influencing you at that age? And I go back and that's, those books, 
I read Dick Gregory. I read uh, Malcolm X. Uh, I read Steinbeck. I, I read both the 30s and the 60s when I was a kid. And those influencing, are influencing me today. So I'm kind of maybe going off on a, a long tangent here, Andy. But, you know, my thing now is the work I want to do, I want to impact young people. But it's not talking to the Oath Keepers. It's something else. I'm not quite sure what it is. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Um, talk to us a little bit about, uh, you know, at least a few times you've mentioned these these events that seem to cause reaction in people. And some of those events are global, like 9-11. Some of them are local, but no less catastrophic for the individuals, like the closing of a plant or um, the destruction of, uh, of a family. How do, just in, in your experience, as you've met people and talked to them and listened, how much are those events um, First of all, they're always going to happen, but how, how much are they influencing this shift in the landscape? Well, we have to deal with the economy. Uh, we have to deal with jobs. We have to deal with treating people well. I, I get frustrated living here in New York, and my and the people I'm surrounded with are of not the one percent. I'm not I'm not in that milieu, <laughs> but I'm surrounded by the top eight percent or ten percent. And you know we're doing pretty well as top eight or ten percent. I, I'm going to show some slides in a minute. I'm going to hold off on those from my most recent reporting on America during the pandemic. Um, yeah. Most Americans are not living that life. Uh, they're working for $7.25 an hour in Ohio as security guards. They're working at Amazon. Even if they're making $12.50 to $15 an hour, uh, their rents are overwhelming, are overwhelming them. They can't feed their children. I, I cannot tell you how many times I've walked into somebody's trailer or suburban house even, and seen empty refrigerators. Um, when you have that kind of uh, uh, tension, uh, economic tension, you're going to have political tension. And, and we have to get back to a place where we're, the, the wealth is trickling down to the majority of Americans. The majority of Americans are not like where I live here in New York City or yeah. where I'm going to be living in Los Angeles in the coming year or two when I move back to California. Uh, they're in places like Huntington Park in Los Angeles, a very immigrant-dominated community, second-generation kids going to school. They're in places like the little town in Iowa. Uh, I, as one of our, I see as a listener in Iowa out there, I lived in Denison, Iowa for a year for a project. Uh, there's there's 8,000 residents there, 3,000 Latino immigrants mostly, uh, some Somalis, but mostly Latino immigrants. And a lot of the, work, the white people there are just as poor as the immigrants. Uh, they're hardworking people, they are, but they're not being paid for the hard jobs they're doing. And how do we overcome that? That's the key. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, talk to us a little bit about um, talk to us a little bit about the role of you know as you describe as you just described that particularly starting in the mid '80s as you started your story tonight. Talk to us a little bit about the middle class, if there is such a thing anymore, right? And and I think you're sort of hitting around the edges of that question, but um, what what has happened to the middle class in your experience, in your narrative experience over the last 40 years? It, it, you know, I, I used to do a thing with my students. I teach a course on social issues reporting, and I would tell them, ask them, what, what's, what's rich to you? And, you know, I, you get a range of answers. And my answer always was, rich is $20,000 more than you make. <laughs> you know, we're all middle class. Uh, the other thing I always like to say is the only way we like talking about class in America when it's preceded by the word middle. We like to pretend mm. we're middle class. Um, you know, but again, what is the, how do you define that? If you make $120,000 a year and you're living in Manhattan, well, you're, you're rich. If you're living in Denison, Iowa, you're making $120,000. Man, dude, you're 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 in the castle on the hill. You're real rich. If you're in New York City and you're paying five or six thousand dollars a month rent for uh, uh, a, a, a two bedroom and you have two kids, uh, you, you know you're 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 poor. You're 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 not really making it. You're 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 scrimping. Uh, it's all relative to where you live. So, mm. but we have this this mythology of the middle class, uh, and it's hard to break if you 
I, I did a project for Smithsonian Magazine on poverty in America in 2016, and I was in California, and I was in Cleveland, and I was in Maine mostly. Um, and I asked everybody the same question. Do you consider yourself poor? Uh, and the answers were amazing. If you, you couch it that way, uh, and um, the guy in California, the, the, he, was a, he worked in a raisin plant. He was a mechanic at a raisin plant up in Madera, California. Uh, he, was, he was building his own house uh, with the help of his neighbors. Uh, it was a program for them. It was really amazing. And I, I, I volunteered. I worked with them. I jackhammered for two days. Uh, and, man, they kicked my butt, man. Uh, I'm a pretty good, pretty good worker, but these guys kicked my butt. And so I got to know these guys really well. So at the end of it, I asked the, one of the workers, I said, do you consider yourself poor? Better than asking if you consider yourself middle class. And he said, see that van over there? It was a beautiful white van, a couple of years old, but beautiful. He says, I saved for three years to pay cash for that van. He said, I have no debt. He says, so you see the person driving the fancy car, the Maserati or the Beamer? But if it's all in debt, who's rich and who's poor? <laughs> and it got me thinking about what 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 is rich and poor? Uh, he paid for everything. His kid was going to be going to college. He had no money, really. But he had a paid-for van. He was going to have a paid-for house and no debt. So who's, who's, who's middle class, who's rich, who's poor? I, I, the more I report, the more I do this, I, I don't know. Mm. Yeah. That's, that's a great way to look at it. In, in, I see some, somebody in the thing. Somebody's from Crawford County. Teresa. Hey, man. Yeah, I love Crawford County. <laughs> Cronk's, <laughs> Cronk's Cafe. You got on Cronk's Cafe, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Uh, what, one last question before we move on. Uh, I'm going to go back to this image. Um, there's a guy with an American flag painted on his chest, and presumably this is uh, around 9-11, early 2000s. Um, it seems to me that the symbolism of the American flag has changed quite a bit in the last 20 years as well. You know, after 9-11, the flag was uh, very much a, a, a symbol of unity and uh, inclusion and us, pull, us, whoever the us is, kind of pulling together um, as, as a nation. Now, you know, you see people being beaten with the flag on uh, early January of this year. Talk to us a little bit about your the ways that you've seen, uh, if not the flag, itself, but patriotism as a concept evolve in your journeys? Wow. Patriotism has become synonymous with nationalism for me. And that's sad because I, I always quote Mark Twain. Mark Twain said, loyalty to the, con to, the, to, the, to the government when it deserves it. Loyalty to the country always. <laughs> and there's a critical distinction there. You know, I'm, I'm of this place. And I love the American people. I love the mosaic of America. Um, uh, I did a book in the 90s. A lot of it was in L.A., actually, uh, uh, called The Coming White Minority. California became a white minority state in 1996. And now whites are like 42% of the population. And I got into what really is America. You know, uh, back in the 1870s and, and, and late 1800s, there was huge pressure for Asian immigration, and we, we basically outlawed it. In 1921, we passed the, the, the uh, we banned citizen children of Japanese people to own land in America, and the Supreme Court upheld it. I mean, so this is like this, this incredible uh, conflict over what America is over the, over the centuries. And moving to California in 1980 when I took a job in Sacramento, it was eye-opening for me, and I, I saw the future, basically. And what America is, is it's a mosaic. It's everybody. And so that flag in that guy's chest doesn't belong to him. It belongs to everybody. It belongs to the people I got to know in southeast Los Angeles and Huntington Park and Bell Gardens and Cudahy. It belongs to the guy in Iowa. It belongs to Mr. Marshall, who landed at D-Day Normandy. It belongs to me. It belongs to my dad. But it got corrupted as a symbol. And the symbol of the flag, if I can go to my next pictures, because it kind of... Please do. You know, yeah. I love my pictures here. I think it's a good segue. Okay. So to set that next picture, I'm not going to show it yet. I'm sequestering in uh, uh, California. I, I actually had COVID in February in, uh, of 2020 with a, a, my friend, the woman I was seeing at the time. Uh, and we, we were exposed to somebody who actually was in China came back feverish. 
it was we couldn't get diagnosed officially. Later, I showed a line as a positive, but we didn't know it was COVID at the time. We were just sick, so we got better. And in March, we went to California, San Diego, and basically isolated ourselves like everybody else for months. Um, and at, by March, by no, I'm sorry, by May or June, we were like stir crazy, and things were starting to open up. And so we went out to the desert to this hotel in the middle of nowhere. It was like this funky 30s hotel. <laughs> it was like out of a, 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 a kind of a Hitchcock movie or a, a, maybe a Twilight Zone movie. And near there in the desert was this, we, we passed this gas station with this American flag on it. And we, we were leaving and it was uh, noon. And my friend said, you wanted to uh, get a picture of that? that? That's pretty cool. I said, oh, the light's too hot. Don't bother. And then about 28 seconds later, I said, stop, stop, stop. So we got out, and we, we, we see this image. Now, this was taken weeks later because I went back when there was good light. I, I've learned from my photographic uh, 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 collaborators how to take pictures. And I went back, and I walked inside, and there was this graffito fucked at birth. My friend's behind me, who's a journalist, and she says, I knew you'd like that. And she said, pause, that's the title of your next book. And I said, no, are you kidding me? A book like that. But I got thinking about it. The juxtaposition of that flag on this dead gas station in the middle of nowhere and somebody crying out with spray paint. I mean, if you zoom in on this, it's like running like blood. Somebody put the spray can close to the plywood and it was like hammering this on the fuck that bird. It's, it was very much a, um, a cry to me, a cry. And then I realized... Well, something happened a few days later. We went back to San Diego, and I was—I saw people at her uh, recycling bin. This couple, and I walked, and they didn't—they looked nervous. And I walked down, and they were scared. I introduced myself, and they were collecting cans. They were homeless for the first time in their lives. They were—they were, you know, in their fifties, uh, and they were proud, and they were trying to make to make money because they—they were—they were unemployed. And I realized. Oh my God! I got to go back on the road. I got to, I got to, I got to document America in this in this moment. Because I had COVID, I felt uh, emboldened. Uh, so I went up to the homeless camps in Sacramento where I'd reported. I did. Put, I should have put some. Of the, I actually did put some of those pictures in here. I'm I'm, I'm actually uh, forgetting my own material. And I went to where where Dorothea Lang. Now I, I got a little backstory on this picture. The top inset picture, black and white. Dorothea Lang was a very famous Farm Security Administration photographer who documented California poverty in the Great Depression. And she went to the homeless camps in Sacramento. This picture that you see in the inset, the one I took that's below is about 100 feet from where she took this picture. 150 feet. Within, I could get the precise spot, but I, I know the levees there and I know where she took it. There were probably as many as 10,000 people in these camps. So uh, uh, upriver, I found this woman, uh, uh, Tawana James. Uh, she's from, from uh, uh, Arkansas, actually, like an Arkansas person out there. Uh, and she built this world. Of, they, they called it the island. The older homeless separated themselves. And there are about 60 camps that are there. Everything you see in this picture, except for one or two items, is from dumpsters. I think the screen was donated to her, but everything else came from dumpsters. Um, what you see at her feet are uh, rolls of, of dough, and she cooks for the, for the, for the people in the camp. Uh, 60, 70 meals a night for like a buck or two each. Uh, she called it pigs in the blanket. She was going to make hot dogs wrapped in dough, cooked over the fire. And... I got, this is like shades of Steinbeck happening here. Uh, thousands of people in these camps. I went to Los Angeles, uh, and uh, the people living out of their cars, and those of you, uh, many L.A. people here, you go along the, the Harbor Freeway, you know what I'm talking about. They were sweeping them out a few weeks ago, all those tent cities along the freeway, uh, up in Topanga Canyon, down in the canyon there's people living. Uh, just, just stunning, stunning homelessness. The kind of stuff I saw in the Philippines in the 80s, in Manila, and in some of the islands. Then I went across the Navajo Reservation into Denver, across America, back to the Youngstown. I went to the meatpacking towns in, 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 uh, in Nebraska and Iowa, ended up in New York City. 
Um, and everybody, the thing I did with everybody, and I'll go back to this picture, everybody I interviewed, I showed them this picture, then I showed them this picture. And I said, what does this mean to you? And I got the American dream, the loss of the American dream, the we have to get the American dream back. Uh, 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 every African-American person I showed this to said, we know that. Uh, like, duh. Um, uh, very few people, though, uh, uh, t John Russo talked about the juxtaposition of the flag, the professor in Youngstown, and the, and the graffiti, and what that says about our country. So the answers were all over the map. And I did a book, and I, I called it after the graffito. Uh, they took out the U and the C, as you can see. <laughs> uh, my publisher, uh, there, there's two people who run my publisher, and one of them loved it, and one of them was like terrified of it. And I really wanted to go with this title because of the, the quest of what did the American dream mean? Now, it's symbolism. This, goes, uh, this is a long answer to your question, Andy. What you see in this is symbolism. That flag and that and that and some people don't like the symbolism. I'm guessing now maybe I'm wrong, but my friend Tom Zolner, who's a, a very well-known writer in Southern California, Tom he teaches at Chapman University. Tom went there about three weeks ago, and it was boarded over. And you'll notice the American flag was erased. And Tom put up the cover of the book on this pole there to kind of memorialize what was there. But somebody didn't like this message of the flag and that statement inside this gas station. I'm guessing. Or they could have just boarded it up just by chance. But I, I doubt it. I doubt it. So that's, that's, the, that's, that's where we have. So anyway, the last slide I have is we have to get back to this, what happened in this image. This is, uh, this is the last image I'll describe. This is the opening of the Franklin Roosevelt Memorial in Washington, D.C. This is about 10, 15 years ago. Maybe, I'm, maybe it's maybe more like 20 years ago. It's a long time ago. Michael Williamson was assigned to cover this. So Michael's always asked, how do you get so lucky with your pictures? Michael stood there for hours waiting, watching with his camera, and this woman walks up and kisses FDR on the cheek. He took this picture. And they went up to her afterwards and said, ma'am, I'm from the Washington Post, and I just took a picture of you kissing FDR. What's going on there? And she told the story about her dad. Uh, apparently, even though he was African-American, he got some of the aid that was given to farmers in the South, uh, uh, which was hard to do in that era when you were a, a black American. It, but he got some of this aid, and he, she said, FDR saved our family. I'm so grateful to him. And I just, to me, it's the most beautiful image. And that story just, just kills me. We have to get back where we care about people. And FDR was about caring for people. Was he perfect? No. Um, but if we go back to a point in our history in the 30s where we say we're going to help people who are working class, how do we get there? And, and I, 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 it's been my mission for 40 years of documenting America where I started with this whole talk. How do we get back to that place? And I think we do it to the kids. I think we do it through this next generation. Uh, that's where I'm landing in all of this. I'll be curious what you have to ask me about this, Andy, and what uh, the people out there who are listening have to say about this. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing uh, that story, uh, the stories and the journey and, and your reflections on it. We do have some questions that are queuing up, and uh, we've got plenty of time to talk a little bit more about this and, and the ways I think that the, the younger students in our audience's classrooms can begin to grapple with these, these realities. Um, the first question I think you, you just answered, but I'm going to ask it again because I think in some ways it might be the, you know, sort of the, uh, the, 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 the big point of our, our conversation tonight. This comes from Allie. Allie is at the Bank Street School in New York City, not so far from you. Um, okay. Allie's wondering if you can talk some about the antidote to this rage, the antidote to this intense existential displacement that so many Americans are experiencing. And I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. I think I, I feel like I've heard you talk some about it, but can you be a little bit more specific? How, what's the answer here, Dale? It's in young people. And I'm, I'm going to give, okay, I'm going to give a dark answer. This is going to be, I might get some, some, <laughs> some, some grief for this. <laughs> 
But look, I, when I did my white minority book in California, 80% of the electorate was white, and mostly older and mostly conservative. Now, again, I don't want to – I'm not dissing these people. They, they know what they know. They grew up with their experience. Uh, you know, I, I'm not putting them down, but they're not going to change. And California was electing Pete Wilson as governor. Our California uh, listeners know that. Um, and it was a very conservative time there still in the 90s. There was Prop 187 was passed against immigration. We, we, we passed an uh, anti-affirmative action uh, uh, initiative. It was very reactionary. Well, California is a very different place now. Well, guess what? Most of those older white voters, I have to say, they passed away. The electorate is far, far less white now. I think it's below 50%. Uh, don't hold me to that. I, it's 50 or 60. It's, 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 I, think, I want to say it's below 50 the last time I looked. And it's not just because of the race of the electorate changed. The age of the electorate changed. Younger people, white or people of color, are not like those people. Uh, I'll go to very conservative places and talk, interview uh, you know, wh white kids, white youth, and you know, being gay is no big deal to them. Gay marriage, whatever. They're accepting of things, even if they're conservative in other ways. So just a transition from an older generation to a younger generation has been transformational in California. Well, guess what? The same thing's going to happen in America. You know, right now, and again, I understand why people in places like Iowa, where I lived, places like Appalachia, Ohio, where I'm from, they're scared. There's change. Change is scary. The... I understand their fears, but their their children and grandchildren necessarily are the same as them. So mm. time alone, I think, will heal. But again, I, I, for us as teachers, uh, uh, I'm, I'm retiring from teaching pretty soon, but I, I, I can, you know, I'm in, in this milieu right now. But as, and as a journalist and as a writer, which I'll be till I die, till I can't do this, I want to exploit how young people can be part of the transformation to what we need to get to in this country, which is an acceptance. So that doesn't mean I want everybody to agree with me politically. Heck no. I grew up with a Republican. My family's a Republican. I have no problem with Republicans like I grew up with. Uh, uh, we differ on some, maybe some of the solutions, but we talked. And I want to get back to where I can talk with people. I, 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 it may not happen in my lifetime, but maybe the kids uh, that you, you guys are teaching out there, it should happen in their lifetime, and I think it will. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And it, it occurs to me that, that you've uh, repositioned and, and well-positioned young people and the, the evolution of generation is one of the keys. Something you said earlier uh, strikes me, and that is you described um, the ways in which what we're exposed to, uh, the books we read, the music we listen to, the uh, experiences we have at the ages of 10, 12, uh, 10, 11, 12 really do form uh, a basis of our worldview. It can evolve, it can, it can change, but that, you know, that's, we're starting to get pretty baked in at that point. By the way, that's why our middle grades teachers are so uh, incredibly important. So given that you mentioned some specifics, you talked about John Steinbeck, you talked about uh, Dick Gregory, what kinds of, you know, this is what the humanities do. What what kinds of humanities tools, what kinds of uh, books or readings or exposures do you think today's young people would really benefit from in order to find this civil discourse you're describing? Wow. Wow. That's a great question. I, I mean, I recommend my own book, but the title alone is going to get it banned from half the schools, <laughs> <laughs> especially in Texas. I'm sorry, you Texas listeners out there, but it's true. Uh, I think... Uh, you know, a lot of it's going to be in fiction, it's not just nonfiction. You know, I think some of the classics like, oh, my God, Zora, ne ne Zora Neale Hurston's Their Eyes Were Watching God. Oh, my gosh. That is a beautiful novel that takes you into the world of these African-American farm workers in Florida. Uh, it's it's done in vernacular, and if you, you, know, you read it, uh, uh, the first – five or six pages, you're like, oh, my God, I can't read this. And by the end, you're like, you don't want it to end because you're into the vernacular. I think some of the Steinbeck still holds up. Um, yeah. uh, it's going to be it's going to be in the uh, cross media. It's going to be in podcasts. It's going to be in film, uh, you know, things that make us think and understand each other. It's going to be in art. It's not going to be in uh, in in in. Uh, uh, 
harsh politics, political rhetoric. It's going to be an art. Yeah, absolutely. And and so then let me let me sort of uh, push this question your way uh, too. Um, I don't necessarily want to talk about social media and technology as it impacts that same experience, but I am struck by how many of us, all of us, frankly, are are documentarians, right? We we're constantly curating our lives. We're presenting them for good, bad, or ill, you know, young people are constantly looking at their lives from a reflexive position, from above, through a lens, through a camera. Um, this might be the generation of documentarians. What do you make of that? What, what are your thoughts about the role of, 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 of journalistic uh, uh, pursuits in this conversation? This, this is why I think art is where it's going to be. I, you, know, you know, we're in the age of unmediated imagery. Uh, that woman, that young woman who won the Pulitzer Prize this year for photographing the death of George Floyd. Exactly. You know, oh my God. The, anybody who's seen that video, if you're not moved by that, you don't have a pulse. I mean, that is such powerful. Uh, any veteran journalist would be proud to have documented that horrifying moment in capturing it. So we don't need us so much anymore as docu you know, clinical documentarians. I think it's going to be in the realm of art, and I, I, I say art in terms of narrative, long-form nonfiction art, fiction, documentary film, uh, uh, because the people who are living it uh, are putting it out there. We need to yeah. curate it. You know, uh, if if you can't find it, it, it's like a tree falling in the forest. You don't know if it exists. But um, uh, so it's morphing and changing. But I think citizen journalism. Look. I was a police reporter in Sacramento, California, when I started in 1980, and I heard about a lot of bad things happening. And I couldn't write about them because there was no documentation. You heard about right. bad cops shooting uh, uh, people of color. I tried to do those stories. I couldn't get them in the paper because there's no – well, he, he, he came at it with a screwdriver. <laughs> you know, and you know it was baloney. Um, but now with video, you don't deny it. And yeah. – uh, I don't think there's any more police violence against people of color than there was then. I just think it's out there to be seen now for the first time. Uh, right. Um, Dale, Professor, you've showed us a lot of images and told stories about your travels, uh, largely interacting with adults. Can you speak at all to any children or young people that you may have encountered, uh, particularly as it relates to their education or their lack of uh, experience in schools? What, where were the kids in your travels? Well, that book I mentioned, the White Minority book, I, I hung out with some kids who were in high school in in, in Huntington Park. Uh, 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 Zoila was Salvadoran American, and I forget what the other what the fellow the kids the other kid's name was. And I was blown away. They were. This was 1992, right after the riots in LA. I met these kids, and they were very politically and environmentally active. And I realized why they were environmentally active. There was some horrible toxic plant they wanted to put in Huntington Park, and they organized in their high school to to protest it. And 10% of that high school, Huntington Park High, about 3,600 kids, were Sierra Club members. I mean, it blew my mind. This was activism I was seeing then. Um, and so I embedded with those kids and really documented what they were doing and really, really... Uh, was impressed by them. Uh, in more recent years, uh, not so much embedding with, with kids, but talking to them a lot. Uh, when I lived in Iowa, I hung out with a lot of high school kids and got their, their point of view on things. Uh, but in recent years, I haven't really embedded so much with the youth. Uh, and I think that's where my work is going to be going. Uh, going back to where we started all this, I, I want to speak to them. And I'm not quite sure how I'm going to do that. It might be in, you know, I, I did my first podcast a few years ago, and it's a medium that I love, and it has much wider um, uh, listenership than anything I would write, and so I'm probably going to explore it that way. Uh, I, I probably will write more about what I wrote about in Cleveland. Uh, I should probably stop here, uh, slow down here, and go back and talk about that a little bit. What are the solutions? And in Cleveland, um, 
the, 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 the democracy collaborative went in there and said, we want to do a model for how people can be empowered economically. We want to start worker-owned businesses. And so the first thing they did was they went into, they started a laundry in East Cleveland. And, and, and there's, you have to understand, Cleveland has all these major institutions, the Cleveland Clinic, uh, 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 universities are, are located there, and they have a lot of laundry that they're paying for a giant corporation to clean. Well, the, 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 the worker-owned cooperative came in, started a laundry, they put all the profits into the workers. They started a, a, a three-acre greenhouse uh, growing Cleveland crisp lettuce in a, a, a former factory site uh, all year round. And they supply restaurants all over northern Ohio with this lettuce. Again, worker-owned cooperative. And then there was a, a third company about solar installation. And now they have about 300, and I did an update about a year ago. They have about 300 employees they have profit sharing. There's no corporate investors. They get the returns on their on their labors. And there's a program for them to purchase houses. Within three years, they're paid off. So they're getting uh, good wages. They're getting health care benefits. Uh, and it's a model that I think I'm excited about, and I want to write more about it, where it's, again, showing people through action how they can better their lives by using capitalism, but a very gentler and kinder form of capitalism uh, to, to, to make their lives better. Uh, so I want to write about that, and I want to write about what youth are doing. Uh, I'm interested in climate action. A lot of these mm -hmm. kids, who, what they're doing, I'm reading about them. But again, I, I, I'm transitioning right now in my work. Uh, I, I'm not sure what the next direction is going to be, but I, it's definitely going to be youth-oriented, and it's going to be oriented towards these models that, that look at how we can have uh, an economic system that is fair to everybody. Fantastic. Thank you. I've got a couple more questions before we conclude our conversation tonight. This next one is a little bit of a, uh, a very specific question. This comes from our friend Teresa. Teresa's in Iowa, and I'm going to go back to this image. And she's wondering if you can tell us what is the white behind the black letters. Uh, is oh, that is a that like holy trinity? Oh, 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 I see. I see the white, the, actually, yeah, the Holy Trinity. Yes. I'm glad she noticed that. Yes. Very interesting juxtaposition. I wasn't going to go into the weeds on that, but it made me think a lot about what that means. I wonder what Teresa thinks about it. <laughs> do, do you have any sense of whether the, the white graffiti was there before the black graffiti, or was it done together, or are they associated uh, in any way? My sense, again, I, I, I don't know. My sense, though, the black is over the, 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 the Trinity graffiti, the black paint. Yeah. And I, I, I want to say it was, because a lot of the graffiti, you, can, you clearly see it was done over time. So I, I want to say it was done sometime later yeah. after the original graffiti. I wonder if the, if, right. the, if the artist chose that piece of plywood for that reason. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, yeah. Wow, Teresa, you're, 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 that's spot on observation. I love it. Professor, I've got one last question for you uh, tonight. Um, talk to us a little bit, if you would, about, um, you know, you talked a lot about, uh, about this sort of, um, this job-oriented culture, the, this work, this uh, way of life, this approach that we take to life, the American dream that is now evaporated. And as you said, you know, the, the job that your dad do, did is just not here anymore. Um, probably the jobs that were around when I was in college and coming out when you were younger, when perhaps even a lot of the students of the teachers that we're working with tonight, they're going to be in a whole different job-oriented world in just a decade, just a couple of decades. Um, do you have any sense of, of the direction that that seems to be going? What What would it take to sort of re-energize our workforce around these opportunities versus uh, just being discarded in, in a tent city in Sacramento? It, it goes back to that Cleveland model. It's treating workers like human beings. Uh, and it's not, I don't want the old paternalistic system, which uh, existed for a long time, uh, but self-empowering people. And I, some of the questions when we were starting were talking about, you know, uh, the meaning of work. And, you know, my father 
yes, I am here talking to you because my father, I'm on, on, on the back of my father I'm standing, him working uh, all day at a factory and then into the evening in the, in the shop in the basement, grinding steel and eating dust. Uh, I'm here because of that. But you have to work that way to make it. And I, I also saw it in the comments, the immigrant community. Look, many of the immigrants I see here in New York, they're riding the subway, they're coming home from their second and third jobs so their kids can, can make it. But is that a way to live? And so a kinder and gentler capitalism like I saw in Cleveland at the Cleveland Evergreen Companies, uh, you know, this is the kind of thing where it's a human kind of capitalism. And I, we have to get there uh, because what is the quality of life if you're just working to eat and fall into bed exhausted? Um, that's, not, that's not a way to live. Uh, it's, and it's not a green way to live. So uh, it's, it's more of a, when I was a kid, and I don't know how many people my age are listening, but uh, we had these magazines, and they talked about the future. <laughs> and the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the early 60s and mid-60s, they, they were still doing this, where we're all going to be writing in jets and pa uh, packs around, around cities, but we're, we're going to be paid to stay home. You know, we would, because there could be, there's going to be so much technology, we're going to have this wonderful world of tomorrow. And it didn't happen. Um, but I, I still think that's possible if we have a human form of capitalism. Uh, so, uh, again, it's for young people, I think, are way more open to these new ideas than people of my generation. Um, so it, it, it's, time, it's time for us to let go. Uh, I, I don't, I'm speaking as an older person now. I, I, I want to be around for a while, but I'm, I'm ready to let go and let, and let the young people take over. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Dale Marich, thank you so much for sharing your story tonight, for uh, sharing your images with us and helping us better understand this American landscape. Thank you so much for joining. Andy, it was wonderful. And, and again, for everybody tuning in, uh, uh, thanks for the great question. I want to thank all of our audience for joining us tonight and encourage you to follow the National Humanities Center on our social media for upcoming opportunities. I'm also going to drop a link to that survey that I mentioned back in the chat box. Please do take a, a few moments. It should take you, I don't know, somewhere around eight or ten minutes to complete. It'd be very valuable um, uh, insights for us as we plan future programming. And we will enter you in one of the coming three, four uh, drawings that we have uh, scheduled. I do hope to see you at our next webinar. Uh, that's next Tuesday night. I'm going to be joined by Daniel Besner from the University of Washington. And he'll be working with us on his work as a political scientist and the connections between modern uh, uh, video games and U.S. foreign policy, in particular, Call of Duty. Uh, hope to see you, uh, everybody, at our next webinar. Have a great day at school tomorrow and uh, have a safe weekend. Good night.